I'd love to just get like a kind of two to three minute rundown of who you are. Okay. So I'm Alex, background mechanical engineering, now a little bit on a sidetrack in the direction of IT. Um, so I met Jeremy, like one of the three of United Manufacturing Hub 2019. Um, we started a system integrator, like really technical hands down, we are the ones laying the cables and creating applications for the shop floor uh, in cooperation with McKinsey. So like we are like the last in the food chain <laughs> on executing whatever they had on ideas. Um, but actually we saw and built a lot like uh, we had different projects in different verticals and all around the world and built actually the United Manufacturing Hub as a side product. So through all of our projects and expertise, uh, we gathered through the years of creating data centric applications around the shop floor. Um, we built the United Manufacturing Hub and put it open source because if it was open source before, it would have helped us immensely as a system integrator. So you, uh, you were working, you were working on a number of projects on the McKinsey mm -hmm. and you decided to pursue UMH. Why, why that out of the other projects? So actually UMH was like the tooling we needed, like really going back in time, um, 20, 2016, 2017, like industrial 4.0 was like the hottest shit in town. Like McKinsey built like this learning factory. It's called digital capability centers. Uh, in between my alma mater and uh, McKinsey was like this corporation. And like there we learned a lot about how great applications like SingWorks, MindSphere, like really 30,000 feet applications are and realize the ones, okay, let's just integrate them. And as we approached like these tools, it was quite clear to us that there's a lot of missing building blocks. And we as opportunistic as we are, we just found a lot of open source tools that could help us there. For example, connecting machines was not possible with ThingWorks. You could use Capware, but like Capware was like not implementable in the modern IT stack. So we saw, okay, we have the nice nice Docker container from Node-RED. It has like a lot of drivers already in it. Let's use it. And then the same goes for how do we transmit the data, MQTT, how do we save the data was first influx and then time scale. There was like so much good stuff out there. And like we just the one stitching it together. And like as a side product at the end, it was like a comprehensive stack that you can put applications on top like ThingWorks, for example. Nice. So if we take a step back then, in terms of kind of IoT. So as I understand mm -hmm. it, there's kind of IT and then mm -hmm. there's OT operating technology and IoT mm -hmm. is a kind of inf interface between the two. Can you kind of make that a bit more detailed and describe where you guys mm -hmm. sit within that stack? This is actually a good question. Like it's, it's a mess to start things off. Like if you put like two people in the same room of IT and OT, the IT guy is the one who's moving fast. Like he just needs to ship applications. So. He really must make sure like the users are loving what he built. So just agile, chip in two week intervals, etc. And if the user then decides the app is trash, he trashes it in 30 seconds. So he's not highly intent of making it uh, super, super robust. In the other hand, OT is like you plan like a power station for nearly half a decade and then you execute on it. So it's like a strict waterfall of requirement that you then put into software and like this is slower. So OT is slower because like a lot of, it's, it's a certified um, environment. And in the end, I don't want to be bullish, but OT is like years behind on innovation and technology because of this mindset. And like, this is where everybody's like talking about this IT, OT convergence theme, like strapping, strapping OT at the back of IT, like really making best practices applicable. And like, this is then somewhere in between this IIoT or industrial IoT who's mixing stuff up, like using sensors to transmit data, like bridging the gap in between. And I think this is then also what we as United Manufacturing are about trying to put like the IT tools, but applicable for the engineer, like really making sure he doesn't need to understand like Kubernetes and Kafka, but he needs to use it to make like his tools more robust and also more usable in the end for, for end users. That makes sense. How, how would you go about that? Because I understand, yeah. It's an interesting point you make about kind of the fast moving nature of software not being mm -hmm. able to be implemented quickly into hardware, which is obviously well known to be slower moving, slower to iterate. Mm -hmm. How yeah. how do you how do you go about solving that problem? So I think at the end, like the automation engineer is constrained by capabilities. Like he has like 
a lot of knowledge on about integrated circuits, laser logic, like the stuff that he uses all the time. And he really wants also to use IT technologies. He wants to have like, for example, a good example is failover. How do you solve failover in OT? Like you have like two servers and one gets shut down, you start up the other one. Like in IT, we have like something like Kubernetes who handles all this complexity for you. And the OT engineer also wants to use it, but he has now the right capabilities at hand. So well, what is what is uh, Kubernetes for the benefit of anyone listening? Yeah, so it really takes care of operating containerized workloads. Like if you have like programs, like and in modern IT architectures, we have a lot of them. It's like the operating system of all these containers. It makes sure like if some container breaks down, it spawns a new one and replaces the old one. Or if the load increases, it spawns more of them. Like an orchestrator of like a, uh, if you like, uh, onto classical music, Kubernetes is the one sitting in front of them and dirigenting, or what would be the right English term, the all doctor. the containers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. That's awesome. And is it kind of an open source platform? Yeah, it's open source. Um, and it's good because it's so complex, so nobody understands Kubernetes. <laughs> and so it's like, <laughs> it's mandatory, more or less, it's open source so that people are, can use, understand it more, and also change it uh, or like make it applicable to their specific needs. And also like they like slimmed down versions for edge devices like K3S and um, that we are also using. So it really open source by nature and there is also then refined in different uh, needs of the customer or like the user. So when we spoke last time, we talked about, you mentioned kind of how open source is being used in B2B applications mm -hmm. and that it hadn't really been transferred over to the manufacturing sector are you guys kind of mm -hmm. like one of the first to do it and then why why do you think it hasn't spread as much as it has mm -hmm. yeah I, I think it's the same reason that before like ot is slower it's more restrained not not in the sense that they are not as smart as it is obviously not the case but like they're heavily constrained on certification etc and open source has not yet been transferred because it's, it's not like you cannot buy open source by Siemens. So in the mind of like uh, a certificator, it's like not as secure, not as reliable. But at the moment, we have like a cool situation in the sense of open source, because if you think about South and Northbound, like Southbound, like a lot of people get really frustrated by the speed of Siemens are moving. Like it's, they like started the term 2011 industrial IoT. Uh, so MindSphere is more or less scrapped, I would say. They have now this new application platform Mendix, and actually nothing is moving there. And on the other side, northbound, like you have this hyperscalers who are really increasing their prices, and everybody in, in manufacturing now has shipped all the data to like AWS and Azure, and now they're really making sure that they also cash out on the opportunities they have ahead. And now, like you're as a manufacturer, you're super frustrated in between these two motions, and now is the chance of open source to really innovate because it applies the same technologies as in hyperscaler. So for example, Azure IoT Hub is a glorified MQTT broker. Um, also their uh, storage could be had as menu for, for object storage or like their SQL offerings. It's all open source available and now manufacturers cost pressure pushes them to open source and innovation, lack of innovation also pushes them away from, from the established players like Siemens, SAP, etc. So this could be a good opportunity but only because the pressure is so high at the moment. Oh, okay. And and essentially the current players, the incumbents, are too slow moving to kind of capitalize and that's where startups can add value. Yeah. Really needs, it, it's kicking then innovation bottom up. Like all these projects were more or less top down. You had like this really, really frustrated with the uh, positioning of established platforms before like we had this 30% uh, efficiency increase. We had this 20% quality increase. When you use MindSphere, when you use Syngworks, I promise. Like this was like a top down decision. And now like all this like for three to four year contracts are now moving out and they didn't increase the efficiency by 30%. And now like this is not the top priority anymore from the top management, but like innovators inside companies, bottom up are really want, or they see the use case where they can improve and they are using open source as a way to get there. And they don't need to have a 5 million contract or like a large um, software provider. They really can do it now and on their own. 
And then the missing building book is in the operation where we focus on, but yeah. Hmm. So I think, yeah, really. for me anyway, and for, I think for a lot of people listening, kind of manufacturing is quite a black box and we see it as, mm-hmm. you know, a s- relatively small set of kind of big players that it would be hard to kind of sell to and crack into. So maybe you can give insight into how you got your first customers. This is actually also a good thing. And I think it's, it's always in progress, but as we started off, like 2021, we started United Manufacturing Up, we were like, okay, let's do it like the old guys told us to do. Uh, get on cold calling, get your first customers on trade fairs, uh, make like fancy presentations. It didn't work for us. <laughs> so we are like the young, like innovators. There's like the, we are, we are putting everything to the test and we're not that profound on 20 years of uh, executive sales role at AWS or first, executive. First principles thinking, right? You're thinking from the yeah. ground up and not just doing yeah, so, it before, yeah. So what we needed to do was like put our expertise in front. Like you saw Jeremy's blog article, and I think it's also on like a podcast. I think it's also the case why you contacted us in the first place. We really need to put what we know and do out there, like especially on the technical side. This is where we are extremely strong. And this is why then large customers approach us. It's crazy, like top down, we don't sell to an Eon, to a Roche, to an Edeka. Like why should we? But like, because we are the only ones applicable on innovating and technical stuff, they really need to suck us in, like because Siemens cannot bring innovation in. Accenture never <laughs> brought innovation or like the large IT companies. Like they're really good. And if you have a specific problem, throw people at it. But if you have like a problem where no solution is yet discovered, it's really hard to squeeze this out of an IT integrator. And this is why like young, smaller companies, still smaller in the relative scale, like we uh, have a really good chance on integrating them into large customers and enterprises. So it's like a, bo- a bottom-up model. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of, it's, it's a great go-to-market lesson, I think. Uh, we spoke about this on a recent board with Rory from Tulip. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. we can talk more about that as well, because I know you know him as well, um, about how it's not just about the idea of the concept, but it's about how you go to market. And I like the, the, the concept that you spend time listening to, you know, mm-hmm. established players, worked out it wasn't for you and found an innovative way to break through and saw success. So can you talk to me about your growth and your usership at the moment? Yeah. So as you said, we are inbound, uh, customer constrained, if you want so. So we really emphasized on what people and how much people are using the United Manufacturing. We only capitalize on a small percentage of all our users. So as we open source, um, like random guys from North Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and the US downloading it. We are like shy of 100 downloads per week of the United Manufacturing Hub. And then like the 100th downloader is in like a large company and he approaches us. He's really um, re-evaluating the tools. This is also a thing you cannot do with a, with a hyperscaler platform or like a software. They have like this marketing slides, but if you get to the product, it takes eight weeks. 50 sales calls and uh, three scheduled product demos. And he can just go download, install, evaluate if the tool is cool for him or not. And this is then where like customers like Roche, Edeka and um, like Eon approach us because we are obviously a solution <laughs> and we are out there and he can push us as hard as he wants up front and then contact us. And this is then the thing that we will expand more. Like now we're entering enterprise sales. Now we have like the first customer scaling through the enterprise and the first customers in their department are super happy. And now it gets, now we need to find a way to the enterprise sales orchestration, uh, find the right people in different departments, et cetera, try to bring them all on the same table, make them fans. This is then the tasks for, for the yeah. next years to come. It just reminds me so much of the bottom up SaaS model and finding that champion yeah. within an organization who can then say to their superiors, like, look, I use this every day. It's such a benefit to me. Um, yeah. it should be adopted uh, company-wide. And, and now try to find this innovator without bottom-up. So try to have like an organization like Roche, for example, like 50,000 people, whatever. I'm not quite sure how many people are there, but now try to find this three people who has the interest, the capabilities, and also the budget on innovating. No chance. Like you get stuck in b- before, and now we are like putting some blog articles out there. It's like a fishing fishing situation. Put them out there and try who bites. And <laughs> who bites is then also a qualified customer for us. And we don't need to waste our time 
um, make so like finding a problem for him that we can solve. We have already identified problem and solution, uh, and let's go. So you, I, I imagine you're testing a range of kind of like material um, mm -hmm. that you're putting out there to generate inbounds and kind of doing some kind of analysis on, you know, what might be the most common use case or the problems that customers feel the most strongly based on the number of inbounds that you're getting. What what are those out of mm -hmm. interest? Like what what are the kind of common use cases that people want to use your technology for? I think this is also a good thing about talking about the tech stack. It's I think the problems are not more in the details. Like it's not about having connectivity or having like a unified namespace data distribution. So like main task connecting data, distributing it, saving it, or and then providing it to like a visualization platform, Power BI, Grafana, whatever. And for all these problems, there are tools out there. Um, so you have, for example, a good tool for connectivity. In my perspective, is something like Litmus. Um, then you have like a cool tool for contextualizing data. This is something like Hybite. And then you, you need like an application platform. This could be Cognite, for example. And the problem is everybody is promising the whole stack. Like we are like the single source of truth on all your problems. Let's go. And then the customers stepping back. Okay. I'm super sure I need at least two more solutions to put on top besides whatever to make my application run. And then they're super afraid on how do I operate this? Like, how do I make sure like this distributed modern microservice architecture is like operatable? And this is where we go in. We have like this end to end tested reference architecture. Like we already laid all the pipes in between the microservices that you can change out as much as you want. And then make sure with all technology um, that you can easily deploy it at scale. So put technologies in like Kafka, Kubernetes, uh, make sure everything is load balanced. It can recover in case of failure and realize the operations under layer to all these great applications to really use them in scale. Yeah. So just for clarity, you're basically sitting on the bottom of that tech stack. Yeah. And I really, I really like the analogy of kind of the piping between mm -hmm. applications that you that you offer. Yeah. Yeah. This is. This is also like a problem that I see at the moment. And also the, it comes back from like the time of where everything started. Everybody is in the marketing channels is saying we do everything. And also we are saying this. So like it, it, it's a, it's a um, problem that is not easily solvable, but as a customer, it's super transparent, which specific tool is good at which specific job. And we try to put a lot of light on this situation for blocker tickets. So what is the best MQTT broker? What is the best database, et cetera? Really making sure that you lift this this fog um, on like this marketing blah blah, and also like on a young challenger perspective, it's a good thing to do. Uh, but yes, this is also a problem that we see at the moment. Because you see, kind of typical advice, particularly in kind of heavy industries, is to find your niche and really focus on one use mm -hmm. case. And you you're saying basically that you haven't found that to be the case, and that a kind of more holistic solution is needed. Um, uh I, I think there is a specific niche for every tool that is out there. Like the problem I would say is that this is a super complex problem and like 90% of all customers don't know that it's required to have different tools for different jobs. Like this is also a thing why we're not selling outbound that heavy. Uh, because if you have like a normal SME guy, I, okay, I need one solution now to solve all my problems. And now if I position myself as a company, like like again litmus as not a solution for all the problems i will not get a sale and this is something different that we do trying to lift it bottom up because um we can then make sure that we're really focusing on the specific problem and really educate um all the potential users then so, so there's a huge kind of education element as yeah. well yeah. yeah yeah if you go on the website you see kind of loads of blogs explanations i really love that you kind of explain it from the really from the bottom up because it is quite an yeah. esoteric topic right i was quickly educating myself in the whole area um it's interesting it's, it's really interesting man like on a personal level why why manufacturing because as i kind of alluded to before i understand that you found the problem there um mm -hmm. but i think to a lot of people you know there's perhaps misconceptions that it's a very kind of resistant to change industry. It would be very yeah. hard to get your startup off the ground. Obviously, you've seen success uh, by getting into, accepted into things like the kind of Intel Ignite accelerator, which we can talk about as well. Um, mm -hmm. But why personally did you think, okay, I'm going to spend, you know, when an entrepreneur sits down, they're thinking, I'm going to spend five to 10 years working on this problem. Uh, what mm -hmm. was it about 
manufacturing that had that pull for you? So I think the first obvious answer is I studied mechanical engineering, so this was my home turf. <laughs> but as a second step, like it's a huge market. Like it's a huge market dominated by established players like Siemens, Beckhoff, Rockwell, uh, Ellen Bradley. And it's super frustrated. Like the whole market is super expensive cash cow securing. So it's, I would say, ready for disruption. And this is like a key thing that I should, or that entrepreneurs should think about before starting a company is the market that I'm operating in ready for something new. And I would say they're overdue on this. And this is why it's such a great opportunity to work in manufacturing. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is it, is it, I understand you had a background in manufacturing as well. You kind of went to work in industry for a couple of years before starting. And what, and no, no, no. I directly started into system integration with Jeremy, like directly from university, wow. jumping into integrating because <laughs> it was, I, I'm technically a theme. Um, Jeremy is, uh, Jeremy is way more technically a theme than I am, but I'm somewhere on the middle ground. And it was always opportunity then. Um, so we directly jumped into it. That's crazy. Most people say, you know, get get the job, learn the ropes for a couple no. of years, but you thought like, no, the, the time is but what should, <laughs> what should you learn? Like it, it, it's, what, what could you learn and the existing, if I worked at Siemens, I would, I think get frustrated yeah. <laughs> because it's yeah. moving so slow and perhaps I would not start a company because I'm so pessimistic on the whole situation <laughs> that I would, <laughs> would just not start it. I think, well, it's, a, it's a great point and obviously kudos for just jumping in straight, but I think the argument that people would use is along the lines of, when you're inside the industry, you really get to understand kind of where mm. the fuck ups are essentially. I mean, we know it's mm. a very slow moving industry. Um, why is it slow moving? You know, what are the pain points? What are the kind of holdups here? How is the decision making made at an enterprise level uh, would be some of the mm. things. But I'm sure you guys learned on the job, right? Um, I, I think I think this is also a good thing that we didn't learn it because we started from scratch on how to get our customers and try to apply classical ZAS. Uh, business motions to manufacturing. Nobody would think this is possible. Like, why? What the fuck? Nobody would buy bottom-up <laughs> manufacturing. Yeah. And I think if we have known the playbook, we would also not have done that. And because we started from scratch, perhaps a little bit idealistic, and it worked. Yeah. It's working. Yeah, I love it. What are the next steps for you and your company then? Uh, is it just continue to continue the momentum, continue to get customers in? Do you have any kind of yes. big plans for the next six months? So um, first really expand on the growth that we at the moment have. Uh, and the key step is make United Manufacturing Hub more applicable for less technical users. So if you like have this technology adoption curve, like you segment it into innovators, early adopters, early majority, et cetera. And we at the moment only focusing on the innovators, like technical profound, frustrated users um, who are also capable of, of doing something on their own, like IT or field. And, now the job will be over the next months and years to make it even easier and more applicable for more engineers in the field. And this is where we also provide um, an additional front end. For example, at the moment, everything is infrastructure as a code. Okay, now we need to make it applicable for engineers. So we need a GUI, et cetera. Um, and this is like from the product perspective and also from a company perspective, um, we will relocate a little bit inside Germany to Cologne. At the moment, we are in Aachen. A little bit too small. It takes just two hours more to get everywhere. So <laughs> we directly think, okay, let's let's move the air. And and also a great opportunity would be like having an US entity um, as a second step for us because like two things, um, the open source landscape is way brighter, wider in the US as in here as in Europe and Germany. And also like US companies tend to buy from US companies. So this is also a second step that we are evaluating at the moment. When, where, how, who, yeah. Now, breaking into the US market would be a huge step, right? Because, you know, yep. people are a bit more loosey-goosey with their cash as well. People are more open to innovation. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's been spoken about a lot on the podcast, I think. I want to hear your take as well about kind of US versus European mentality, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to startup. I think um, the, the European sector flounders a little bit. I think um, it is a combination of just lack of investment, but also the mentality of the people that live there. I just don't yep. think we have that entrepreneurial uh, a kind of uh, culture. And I know I'm mm. saying there is in Europe, obviously we have the UK, we have Germany, have all these different um, subsets. But I think in compared to the US, we can to a certain degree be seen as one entity. Um, yep. 
particularly in the EU regarding regulation and, as I said, kind of attitudes towards innovation. Is that something you've seen as well? Um, yeah. Just as a, from an entrepreneur's perspective. I would especially see this on the money landscape. So on the venture capital side, I think we are still quite young in the sense of as a region on venture capital. So like most funds popped up somewhere between 2015, 2018-ish. So right, right, right in the middle of the bull run, funnily enough. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Right. so they never experienced like a crisis and didn't survive it. Like it's it's like it's a moment like it's a hard situation for a lot of VCs. Like, and whoever is left there is wiser, older, and also is more willing to take risk. And this is like the thing that I'm not that happy about with the European funding landscape. They try to search for for north stars, like have like their pre-made boxes, this is a SaaS company, this is an open source company, this is a manufacturing company. And if you don't fit in one, uh, I don't get it, it's too risky, whatever, out. And we as an open source company manufacturing, we don't fit into a box. Um, so we have also way more interest from US investors um, than we have from European investors because we are new and other than different and existing playbooks. Uh, there's a stat where it's like, you know the the proportion of investors from the UK in particular. I don't think it's Europe. I think it's just the UK um, that mm. have you know a finance or kind of MBA background. It's about seventy to eighty mm. percent, and it really shows, right? Because I mean, what are you taught in finance backgrounds? What are you taught in MBAs to tick boxes mm. to fulfill criteria? Um, whereas I think in the US, the number is almost flipped. I believe it might be like fifty to sixty percent actually founded in the past. So it's much more of that entrepreneurial mindset and kind of being able to quickly identify innovation um, without having mm. to dig too deep and think about all of the drawbacks and this and that. Yeah. It's also like, I think in the European landscape, it's like we have like a list of 10 arguments and if the majority suck and even if there are three are really innovative, great, it would be a no deal for them. But in the US, if you have like one secret source that is changing everything, they mm. dig into this and they try to understand, try to really grasp your ideas there and then they're happy to work with you. Uh, but in the in Germany, it's like more numbers constraints. Uh, my calculator solves your no deal. Yeah. I, I, I cannot do it. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah. I think that there is a push now in terms of kind of like uni spin outs and more hardware, yeah. science heavy um, technologies. I'll be speaking to them, a couple of these guys in the co next couple of months or so. And just talking about how, you know, they don't get enough of the spotlight, they don't get enough attention. There's there's a poor understanding. Um, mm. It's kind of this rough interface between the technology and consumers and investors and how it will go to market and all of this stuff, right? So hopefully we see a push um, over the coming years for Europe and kind of, you know, somewhat spurred by this kind of tech, the bursting of the tech bubble, I would hope that people would start to look to more industrial solutions and deep tech solutions, if you will. Yeah. And I think especially the deep tech thing could be a good, good starting point for Europe because it's also not mature in the US, like deep tech is like a, or like, especially in Europe, you have like the huge university landscape, like a lot of innovation is happening in universities. And you, the US was capable of providing like this innovation and build up as companies in Europe, it was not happening before because, but we have like more innovation in universities than in the US, like uh, more, more prices in general and i think there could be a good thing to start off like this deep tech things that you really can already understand if you dive deep and this could be also a good thing for european investors to get started but we are not yeah. deep tech deep tech uh like we don't uh, have like a new process node or a new sensor that analyzes like liquid by flowing through it like we are more software and yeah obvious yeah i think i think sometimes people use deep tech as a massive catch all like if you're if your customers in industry and not, you know, consumers or traditional businesses. Yeah, they, say, oh, they, they slap the deep tech uh, label. Yeah, I don't understand it. Deep tech. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's not a consumer facing app, and it's not like a B two B thing. Yeah, deep tech. That's it. But I think yeah, yeah there's, there's there's a couple problems just in the UK. I mean, just speaking to people, I think it's as I said, lack of understanding. Also, the support system isn't there, so you just have this huge gap between. You know, take the professor who's been working on a problem for 20 mm. years and he takes his PhD with him. Um, none of them really have any commercial experience. Uh, you know, none of them has really worked in a job in industry. And, mm. you know, I think in the US that wouldn't be frowned upon because they have the support system to kind of commercialize yeah. it and all of this. In the UK, there is a little bit of friction. Um and I think that's what accelerators are literally trying to do now. You have VCs jump in and, you know, sometimes not even giving money 
um, not even investing, but actually giving them that commercial expertise and setting them up with, you know, either the, you know, corporate that they collaborate with or helping them go out and get customers. Yes, this is also Intel Ignite in a nutshell. So like as a sub- equity-free support system with industry experience, like yep. perhaps also to jump jump in there, like as a company, like we worked like or like talked to Intel like actually a few years back now um, because they try to push into manufacturing or sell more actively their processors, like they're obviously supplying like the Siemens, the back of the world, but making more out of like existing existing opportunity like with uh, putting controllers on hpcs and not on on um, on logic controllers anymore and so we worked with them with the open source approach is great and so they asked us if we want to join them last year uh, we perhaps it was also not 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 that arrogant from us so we say we don't need an accelerator why what what does you supply us with what network do you have we were super pessimistic about this accelerator thing because we we seen like this university accelerators like yeah. we're like some random mckinsey leaf guy like three years experience in management consulting is now telling you how to build a company we're saying no why so please please don't waste our time and then we heard more about the intel ignite program and especially like this deep interconnection with intel and also the people working there actually founded companies sold companies raised money and okay we, we can learn something from them and this is why we applied this year again, or applied this year finally, and are super happy to be in there. And actually, next week is also the kickoff, or like whenever you hear this, like the first May week, we get things things started there. No, I, I appreciate the honesty as well, saying that you're like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? And then, you know, that you came around yeah. to it. No, I get it completely as well. It's, it's the yeah. same to a certain degree with consultants, right? You know, someone who's yeah. been just looking from the outside in in the industry for a couple of years since they can tell you how to run a company. Uh, I think it can yeah. have its uses when it comes to things like, you know, raising money, they can have their input, but to kind of be in an yeah. accelerator where none of them are ex-founders is uh, probably a bad move. And they read like the lean startup on Eric Reese once and now they're like <laughs> uh, consultants for startups and like, okay. So like, if you really just get started, like if you have like an idea, they can give you like the framework on how to figure this out, like business model canvas here, um, trial, trial and error on like positioning, etc. So they, if you really get started, it could be good. But if you have some traction and already did like the obvious things, uh, I think the value proposition is quite low. And then experienced founders plus this heavy network is like also super valuable if you're later in the stage. I, th- I think, I think, man, it's a degree. It's like watching a football game versus playing football, right? It's like yeah. you, can, you can watch you can watch a Premier League game and you know analyze it and know everything you want to know about the formation, about the tactics, mm-hmm. about different positions. Uh, but you you never kick the ball in your life. You don't actually know what yeah. it's like to be on the field, right? Yeah, uh, uh, I'm quite sure if a startup would fail, they could directly explain you why. But if they're in the situation, I think they not would give you the right advice to steer it around. Like, and this is what what we are looking for. We have like people who have been to like a personal like crisis like which will come up at some point with us as a company it will be an up and down and in this situation we want to have like a profound network of ex-founders who can then help us take yeah. the right decisions no absolutely can you give insight as well into like what your application process was and what what were the kind of things they were looking for so it, it was super straightforward actually like we had like a few introduction calls like i think it was only two um like the first one, just getting the Intel Ignite team, they're pitching us on the opportunity and then uh, want to ask other brain. So then we applied. And then the next step was a pre-pitch, if you want so, like a free um, evaluation of the Intel team. Is this like something that we should look at or not? And then was uh, the pitch day of Intel Ignite. There was like 18 companies then left from like this 300 that they that applied. And um, so we pitched against other deep techs or, or together, like whatever, but their focus, especially on impact, like if this goes right, what impact could have this on society, um, what are like our traction marks, what did we already achieve, like from product, from market perspectives. And um, yeah, this is then where then the jury, it was mostly um, investors, like um evaluated our performance and we got in nice congrats yeah you guys obviously in telling night don't you know take any equity are you looking for funds at the moment mm-hmm. so we at the moment completely bootstrapped like 
we we had like have a funding investor um, who I like, kicked things off, give us some money to rent an office, uh, buy us some sell some laptops, etc. But since then, we had a high focus on make sure that we don't burn more money that we get from product and uh, sometime back also consultancy sales. And now, as we have like this product market fit on our side, it really having or being money constrained and being like under constant pressure was a huge thing for us to get product market fit right because if you throw money at it too early, like you freeze your current value proposition more or less. You have like still, still agility, but you reduce your flexibility. And as we have this right now, we are planning to raise um, our large first round um, in mid of this year. It's like the plan of this. Like we're not quite sure when, which months. Um, we just want to have the Intel Ignite team also to sharpen our very proposition there and make sure that everybody investors is understanding what we're saying because as like an open source startup in manufacturing, what where there are no playbooks, we need to make sure um, that also investors and not only customers understanding what Rally will provide. And then um, we will race race around. Now, nah, all the best with that. So you're going to launch a roadshow? You, ha you haven't started yet? or so we, Yeah, so we are at the moment still in the evaluating phase. So we're collecting like who could be great. So we really want to make sure we have the right investor on board. So first, like good reputation. So either in industrial B2B or end or commercial open source software, because we need to get both things right here. And so speaking to first investors, making sure that like the portfolio that they have is not conflicting, that they um, are at the right fit and then line them up for process uh, in the next months and execute then from there on. How are you finding it, like conv conveying your value proposition? Because I know when you speak to a lot of, you know, not necessarily deep tech, but people are working on kind of more esoteric topics, it's very hard to convey. <laughs> I remember I was talking to a, like a founder who wanted to help with their pitch deck. I said, okay, send so what you have through right now. And they were working on something more advanced and kind of underpinned by AI. And they sent me like mm. a, you know, 50, 60 page, you know, basically <laughs> technical thesis on, you know, everything yeah. you did, what the technology does, the history of this and that. How, how are you finding it kind of trying to distill all of that into you know 10 15 pages this is i think the hardest thing to do so, <laughs> <laughs> so as, as like technical i, love, product, I, I just love it like any anyone who just went to you know did like a finance course and degree like this is easy this is easy and no, all the stuff you're doing under the under the surface is hard for it, and you just flipped it i love it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it's like as like a technical founding team you always try to get into the specifics, like, why is it so great? Uh, then you narrow down like your, all your thoughts onto pages as first, you need to understand this and then this and this. And at the end, it's great. Like the 60s pages documents that somebody showed you. And now it's really hard to get a step back and a step back and a step back and make sure everything or like the end result is still communicatable via three slides, like situation, problem, solution. And not only like as a long consequence of your thought that you have like understood over the last three to four years so nobody can follow you and this is i think a hard thing to do for like tech tech founders no 100 uh, can you give me your one line is it you know problem solution and, and your kind of tagline one yeah, sentence so, each so the problem that we see at the moment it's like the industry is trying to converge it and ot together like having it ready for like advanced applications, AI, and also large data analytics to make really use of the shop floor. Um, the problem that we see is it's it's too complex. So uh, enterprises are stuck in pilot trap because they're overwhelmed by operating this large complex infrastructure. The building blocks are there, but they cannot use it at scale yet. And with us, we are the first to operate and manage your whole IT infrastructure to then enable production critical use cases like really put an emphasis on operating and building it. Nice. And I think it comes over, but... <laughs> <laughs> like a couple of sentences each and we can just like slap it on, yeah. Oh, so you, you mentioned AI actually, kind of what... Yeah. When, I, when I spoke to Rory, we talked a lot about computer vision and how it was basically, mm -hmm. you know, not replacing humans on the shop floor, but more, you know, giving them superpowers and harnessing them all of this um, by helping mm -hmm. them to kind of detect defects and help with maintenance. I know a couple of companies as well that are kind of working on analyzing, you know, defects in materials and composites, uh, which can just be done at the click of a fingers with AI, obviously, instead of, you know, done more manually. How else do you kind of see AI start to infiltrate the manufacturing sector? Yeah. 
So I think it's the obvious choose uh, it, it's computer vision. Like uh, we have also a friend at startup who started also a few years back with us. They call Anticipate. So they also focus on um, making AI applicable for engineers to solve. Um, like it's it, it's about like um, mounting stuff. So like putting a camera on top. Uh, the people are still um, putting together the stuff that they want to produce, and they make sure with AI that they don't do any errors. So like really empowering the engineer. Like the same. Uh, tech lines that Tulip would put on their flags, uh, like uh, they're saying, democratizing frontline operations. But it's there's an obvious choose, but and also where it has like the highest impact at all daily doing at the moment at, at co doing code. Like like most of our code is now generated at the first step in in, in chat GPT or like large <laughs> uh, sc scale language models. And making this then applicable also for engineering would be a huge, huge thing. I think it's still years to come because like uh, automation and PLC programming is still super locked down, not best practice. And obviously there's no, not a large training set of automation code in the internet where ChatGPT can train <laughs> on, but this could be also a real thing uh, to, to uh, reduce this bottleneck on automation engineers to empower them like it already happened to IT, IT engineers. But this is, I think, still some years to come because first we need to make sure that Demon is providing more transparency in what they're doing. And, and if we fast forward five years, are you in the camp of, you know, all of these jobs are going to go, all of these programming jobs are going to no. just evaporate, or do you think it's just going to no, no. Height, it, heighten the, and kind of enhance the user? At the moment, like industrial automation is not constrained by opportunities, by jobs, because you could like, Tesla is having a super hard time to find automation engineers uh, to automate their shop floor. So it's not that they want to reduce costs by like reducing uh, workforce, but it's more like they have more opportunities that they can throw automation engineers onto. So like with AI, you can supercharge each individual automation engineer to have more impact. So I would say, no, there will be the same amount of jobs, but more impact from each person generated them. And, and across all industries, you think that to be the case, you know, even even lower le level kind of programmers at you know big tech software companies, you're seeing huge amounts of layoffs. Twitter mm. realizing that they can run on kind of you know eighty percent, ninety percent layoffs. Do you see that as a trend yeah, that's going to continue? Yeah, but did they fire like the engineers or did they fire the overhead? <laughs> I'm I'm quite sure they mostly fired the overhead. Like Most, the... Mostly middle managers, <laughs> but then there was also the thing about Musk and yeah. he. Uh, he asked one of the, all of the engineers to cough up a bit of code that they'd done recently, right? And if they couldn't defend it or it wasn't impressive enough, that they just got the chop. Oh, he tries to identify overhead in this way, but I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> for sure like, like engineers have their place. Software engineers are like the most valuable resource in every technology company. And like, like the shake in big tech, from my perspective, perhaps I'm, I'm not super deep into it. It was mostly like, Let's get rid of strategic alliance managers. Let's get rid of like this social marketing manager. Also like these middle management, like, you know, people yeah, who are like, do, creating direct work essentially. Yeah, exactly. And, and like the engineers are, and especially like capable ones are still super, super rare. So I think it's less stress than before. You're right. Like um, the job market is good for hiring such high potential people. Uh, but they have still not, they have now 15 opportunities and not 50. So they're, they're still in, 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 uh, high demand. How, how do you feel about more consumer centric applications of AI? Like all of this generative stuff. Um, I think it, obviously there's going to be loads and loads that go to zero. There's a lot of noise mm -hmm. around it right now. We're probably going to see a bubble like we do with crypto and web three. Um, <laughs> how do, I've, no, genuinely, I think that's going to be the case, right? Um, I think so yeah. much of it is just the same thing again, you know, play, kind of putting a, a different sticker on top of ChatGPT and saying, oh, we yeah. can convert this text to image to video now, whatever. And I think on top of that as well, the rate of acceleration of kind of innovation and the, the way stuff is developing, not on a kind of, you know, month or month or year by year basis, but, you know, each week there's someone who's come up with some crazy thing. It can probably be mm -hmm. very hard for investors and founders even to know where to spend their time. Um, do you think, do you think this is more of a hype bubble? Do you think it's here to stay? And what do you think the best applications are for it right now? I think it's, it's here to stay. So like concrete example, did you use web three personally or not? Like I'm not, and I don't know anybody else, perhaps like some 
NFT dudes, NFT bros. Who just, try to, just the innovators, right? Going, going back to what you said, it's like just, just that it yeah. never got past the first bit of the curve on the technology yeah. adoption curve. And mostly like hype guys, like now I can try my trade my uh, gorilla NFT and make like shit loads of money in five days. Like <laughs> that was obviously not sustainable, but my mother is now using ChatGPT. Like really, people obviously not, not on the innovator scale <laughs> are using it and, and extracting value. So there's so much, so much more fundamental change in this tool than Web3. And yeah, well, so what, I, what, I is your, what is your mom? What is your mom using for out of interest? I, I think it, 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 it was for I think it was for like an invitation card, something like this. Like she wants to celebrate her birthday, yeah. and so she ask ChatGPT also in German, so it, it also works in German, to give like a few lines uh, that she can put it in so that it has some real new world use cases, also yeah. for like not the innovators there. Well, what do you feel about the whole argument around kind of, you know, royalties and, you know, IP and this and that, right? In a world where like you just, you just scroll through social media, you'll see people making AI generated mm -hmm. media of like you know michael jackson singing a current song or something right and all of this stuff and mm -hmm. you, you can easily picture a world where you know artists are completely ripped mm -hmm. off where you know new songs are made from someone else's voice and you know you have people saying things that they never did i mean that's prevalent everywhere already like all these fake mm -hmm. podcasts um how do you think we kind of address that problem or do you not see it to be a problem mm, i don't see it as like a general problem because I think if you are still innovate, like ChatGPT can only be like intermedia by definition. Like it can only produce like uh, intermediate content, intermediate image, or like uh, if you have like an um, image creation AI, it can only do like stuff that has been done before. And you have like really innovative people in design and in, in writing, etc. They need to be really innovative to keep keep up. So if they're just recycling, just content, like the bar, right? it just raises, it raises the, the bar. The so like people who like at, at local media printeries who just recycle stuff that was interesting three weeks before, yeah, they're disrupted. So there's no, also this Fiverr guys who need to write you an um, correct proofread, for example, something like repetitive tasks with no real innovation and, anymore. And anything really, I mean, even this like is, vast majority of design and logo creation, I mean, think about how much of that is not actually innovative and that has been done yeah. you know, a thousand times before. Yeah, so like all the uninnovative applications. So like I think Fiverr is super heavily disrupted by ChatGPT. Uh, oh, it's done. So, it's, a, it's a wrap. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's completely done. Yeah, yeah, but but I think if you really want to push the boundaries on everything, so design, text, whatever, um, the human is still the most important piece there. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think there's, I think metaverse and stuff like that proved as well that we still need that human connection. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, these things are taking off and I don't think AI is here to completely remove all of these interactions that we have between humans. Because we're still yeah. human at the end of the day. I mean, how do you prefer doing it over Zoom or do you prefer doing it in person, right? I think 90% yeah. of people say in person. Um, yeah. It's a convenience in the same way AI, AI makes stuff convenient, but it's never going to replace those real interactions. Yeah. So like, it's like making something possible that has not been possible before because uh, I would... Uh, perhaps not been flying over to a podcast to you. Uh, so now we have like this technology <laughs> innovation here to make this possible, but I would still prefer to have it in person with you. But I think the, the bottom line is still the same. In person, better innovation from people better, but it enhances like the impact or like the possibilities that we have. And where, where do you think investors should focus then in particular like VCs? Because it's of my opinion that, you know, as we discussed, they should really look into mm -hmm. the, the, the clean tech, the deep tech, the hard sciences to have solutions, you know, that are going to affect the world in the next 10 years. If you can just future cast mm -hmm. and think, you know, mm -hmm. are we running the, you know, the world into the ground in terms of, you know, the climate impact emissions? Mm -hmm. Um, can we invest there more heavily? Where do you see the areas that VCs should be looking at over the next like 10 years? I think sustainability is an obvious one. So this is obviously not a bubble. So perhaps like the, the amount of, of investment is, is perhaps over the top, but like it's obviously a large problem. So having a, a huge focus on this is a really, really good one. But um, I think the most important thing for investors to stay curious on the details, like not because somebody is printing out this. This is like a thing that I hate. Like as a company now, we could also print sustainability on top of because we empower like manufacturers to know how much power they uh, um, like lose inside machines, how much CO2 is emitted, but it's not, or 
obvious value proposition. So we don't print like this stamp on top of United Manufacturing app and filter this shit out and really focus only on like people who are really contributing to sustainable ideas. This is something where investors should focus about and not not the, the noise people are generating on um, interchangeable ideas just with sustainability on top. Exactly. I think in terms of the ESG point, it's not even kind of a value proposition that not everyone has. It's not even a value proposition, frankly. I've, I've seen VCs mm. who have kind of their whole thesis is around, you know, behavioral, you know, changing the behavior of companies and people mm. when it comes to, you know, how much energy they use and this and that. And you actually question like, how, how, how is this going to affect, you know, how is this going to reach the, the end goal mm. of reducing emissions or cutting, you know, reaching the kind of 2050 targets in the EU? Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's another thing as well, which is not, people not considering the life cycle of things. I don't know how into kind of the energy sector you are, but it's very interesting because Germany obviously shut down recently their last nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. I understand it's kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys have been kind of waging a war against nuclear since even before <laughs> Chernobyl and, you know, for like kind yeah. of 50 plus years. Um, it'd be really interesting if you know anything about that sector, like why is that the case and what your views are on Germany shutting down the loss of the nuclear plants and whether they should reverse that decision. I think it's it's not reversible and also not, not, not on the fence like other Germans are on. We need to ignite everything back, build more power stations. I think it's an obvious technology of the past. Like it's not, not sustainable in the long term, but we could have done us a favor and let them run a little bit longer because now we need to solve two hard problems like the climate crisis first. This could be a solution to this. And now we also need to have an energy crisis because we have two less power on our grid. Uh, perhaps, yeah. perhaps a little bit more foresight. And I think still nuclear power generation is, is, is a thing of the past, but we as Germans tend to make it harder than it needs to be on, on specific problems. That's really interesting. So you're, you're much more in the renewables camp because I've, I've spoken to people who are just diehard nuclear. Um, and I've spoken to people who just, you know, say it should be yeah. some somewhat of a mix and nuclear can actually be used yeah. as a bridge to get to the pure yeah. uh, green it, electricity. It, yeah, I think it's, 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 it should be a bridge. Like, it's great. I, I don't understand, like, I think a few years back still, like, gas, like, gas-powered um, power generation was, like, a sustainable alternative. And then we shut down uh, atomic, like, uh, nuclear fission reactors. Uh, like, this, this doesn't make sense from my perspective. Um, but as a bridge technology is cool, uh, have a clear path to put them out of the grid is also cool because friends, like they're all over the place. Nuclear fission is like the way to go. I'm also not, this is also not on the other extreme, also not great. Um, but I think this was a lot of like after Fukushima, it was like super random. Like it was, I was still way younger than yet, but it was like, okay, let's go out of nuclear fission in 10 years. And okay. Uh, okay. Good thing to do. But I think it was not clear to us to have like a, this climate crisis so uh close to us so yeah yeah there's no forward thinking right so there must yeah. have been a lot of external pressure um i think government maybe would you say pandering to the populace and kind of what their opinion of it was yeah i think so i think it was obviously a really really bad thing that happened in fukushima and so like the uh, the public opinion was obviously nuclear fission is bad that we should get rid of it so it was, okay, let's get rid of it and not like step back. Okay. When we should get rid of it, what's our clear path. Um, yeah. And I think this is, we have no, 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 not a clear enough path, um, on sustainable power generation to just get rid of it. But now it's too late. So don't get me wrong. I'm not like the guy saying we need to make like our Bavarian minister. Like he's all over the place always. Um, he just wants to. And also separate Germany, but separate Bavaria uh, on the on the decision that atomic needs to go. So this is super random. Uh, let's not waste our time on such random di random discussions. But yeah, this is what it is to a certain degree. But man, yeah, we ha we have to wrap up soon. But it's been fantastic talking. Um, yeah. Before you you know before you do any promotion that you kind of want to do, I wanted to ask one more thing, which is where should startups focus on? in the manufacturing sector. If you're someone kind of coming out of university as you did, uh, and you're really keen to get into the manufacturing mm -hmm. sector and start your own company, where would be the first places to look? So I think it's bringing outside innovation. And this is like a place super hungry for innovation. And I think we have a lot of startups already focusing on the operations part of factories, like improving quality, uh, effectiveness, etc. like from 
engineering's perspective, I think if you like a tech-minded startup, try to push IT into manufacturing, like bring innovation that happened somewhere else in manufacturing because this place is in dire need of innovation and something that happened somewhere else can also also work there. I think this is a good thesis on how to how to work with manufacturing or with industrial applications in general. No, because it, because it is what twenty years behind uh, most of yes. the sectors is that thing. I think we'll, hopefully we see a proliferation soon and a lot of startups enter the space. But yeah, Matt, as I said, pleasure talking. Uh, if you want to do any promotion or before we wrap up, you're far away. Sure. So I think I don't want to promote a company, but I would want to promote a community. Like as I don't know if you know, but we have a really really cool and active Discord. Like for people who are technically minded and want to have answers to the complicated questions here. So feel free to jump in, look at our Discord and also our learning platform with all great blog articles from Jeremy are combined in. So yeah, feel free to have a look. Love it. No, fantastic. Again, um, all the best for the future. Let's keep in touch. I would love to see how you guys grow over the next, you know, a few months and how Intel Ignite is as well, whether you see the benefits from it as well. So all the best. I keep you posted. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. All the best. Take care.